Betfred has come all the way from England to the great state of Iowa. With over 50 years of sports betting experience, Fred is known in the UK for three things. Customer service, bonuses, and delivering the best overall experience to players. Need more? Download the Betfred Sports app today and receive up to $250 in free bets when signing up. No emperors, no movie stars, just a sports book you can trust. Download today. Proud partner of the Iowa Wild and Iowa Cubs. Must be 21 plus. Wagers only accepted in Iowa. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. So, I mean, what am I supposed to do if I don't have good projections, Derek? I mean, that's exactly it. If you don't have good projections, you're dead. So uh, I feel like that's a compliment. Yeah, that's what I mean. They, I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't watch uh, the all 22 and just have a beautiful uh, ability to juggle all these variables in my mind on my own and know who to play. But uh, yeah, they get. do you get blowback for being a slave to the numbers too much? Does anyone ever accuse you of not watching the games? Oh, all, all the time. And it's always people who don't understand math or don't like projections. You know, it's the hand builder bros. Like, I, I don't, I'm not about that life. But uh, yeah, any anytime you talk about projections or math or, or probability or range of outcomes, like people just, they get really upset. They're like, no, this is what happened. Like that, and no. So here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we are going to talk cash games, and then we are going to dive in specifically to this Week 17 slate, which continues to get flipped on its head over and over. The questions I am about to ask to Derek about cash, um, they are for you, the audience. I am uh, I, I am a domain expert on cash games, so I am a proxy for the audience here. So don't let my questioning make you think I don't know what I'm talking about. But Derek, one question I wanted to ask you right at the top, as a former GPP bro, I have been accepting a lot of head-to-heads this week. I'm oversubscribed at 5 and $10. DraftKings won't even let me accept those. So you got to try 1, 2, or 20, I believe, if you want to play me. I normally play somewhere between $750 to $1,000 in my single-entry contest back before I turned in my GPP bro card. What do you think, based on that bankroll, is an acceptable amount to have in play for head-to-heads this week? So in general, you can play heavier, a heavier percentage of your bankroll on head to heads because they're a little more stable In GPPs. You're going to, you know, losing week, losing week, losing week, eventually big winning week. So you need to be able to have enough money in your account to sustain that kind of play in GPPs. But in cash games, you know, it's very rare. You know, you're having, I lost everything this week. I lost everything next week. I lost everything the week after that. Like, you're making some back regardless, and ideally you are winning more than you're losing. And so you can play a higher percentage of your bankroll in cash games. So if you're playing, you know, one or two percent of your bankroll in GPPs, you know, you can play five or ten percent in cash games. Okay. All right. I'm feeling more comfortable. And my other hope here, Derek, is I am uh, do you first of all, do you get sent a lot of head-to-head invites on DraftKings? Just people want to go in against the Blitz guy? I don't like, I, it, which is kind of surprising. Like I know, you know, I know you've got a bunch this week and I know on the, the swole cast like Davis and Sammy and Nate, like they're always talking about how they're getting sent head to heads from people who think they're fish. Um, I don't get a lot of that though. Um, what is your, let's, let's do a little uh, marketing for you. What is your, what's your DK handle right now? It's Derek Hardy. It's not hard to find me. <laughs> okay. I am going to put this down here on the uh, the banner because I Derek Cardi needs some love in these head to head streets. You guys are all coming at me. If you want to play a five or ten dollar and you didn't get in against me today, um, you need to send it to Derek Cardi. So there we go. Please scoop me, bro. Derek Cardi <laughs> and revert Z top on DraftKings. Let's get Derek some head to heads this week so he can feel the love. Um, my other thought on this is. What is your thought? Because I've been getting a lot of head-to-heads early in the week, maybe from people that don't normally play cash, much less cash in week 17. I'm thinking I'm going to get some soft action here of people who might not want to grind this slate as hard as they thought they did on Tuesday. Well, I think a lot of people are like, oh, Pete's doing a bit. You know, he, he doesn't know what he's doing in cash games. I'm just going to send him, you know, a hundred dollar head to head or whatever. And, and I'm going to have edge against him. And I don't think that's going to be the case. Like I can see, I do think like this is sort of a bit, but like you're taking it seriously. Like you're going to put out a good lineup. And so, uh, so yeah, I think these people are, are going to have another thing coming. Yeah. So I can, I can show it right here. If people think I'm doing a bit, uh, I am exclusively in head to heads and I'm in three of the big double ups. Um, but I have $2,000 in play right now, exclusively in cash games at basically all levels from, one dollar, two dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, 
$20, $50, a few 109s, and one one hot shot sent me a 215, Derek. Uh, I mean, that's all cool, but I'm more interested in the chalk donkey death match. I, I don't get an invite to that every week. How do you get into that one? Yeah, you know, I, I've gotten some. Yeah, where are the names here? I've gotten a lot of. I got a scoop me, bro. Um, you know, peep, don't dupe me, bro. Number one, uh, scooper pooper. Uh, so yeah, a lot of creativity in these head to head names here. So yeah, I'm excited. Um, and let's just start from scratch. Uh, now that we got our, our money in play, uh, figured out if you didn't do projections yourself, but you were going to be a cash game player, when would you look, um, at the slate, start building out your shell, start getting comfortable because we do see news change things so much. Do you worried about getting anchored to plays in the same way GPP bros do? Yeah, I mean that's definitely a thing that people can, you know, can do in cash games. You have your your shell all week and then, you know, something happens and and the right move is to switch, but like you're so emotionally attached to it that you don't. We saw it a couple weeks ago. Tony Tony Pollard was a stone lock, but we didn't know Ezekiel Elliott was out until an hour and a half before the slate. And Tony Pollard like was in every optimal lineup, probably not just in the blitz. I would imagine in other systems too. And he was like 20% owned in like the $25 single entry double up or something like that. Like just absurdly low owned because people, you know, they're not willing to react or they're too attached to what they've already built or whatever the reason is. Um, but I mean, you can look all week as long as you can stay objective about it. Like it's good to have a feel for the slate, but Friday afternoon is always a big one because we get a bunch of inactive news this week, week 17, a lot more is up in the air. So like tomorrow when we get practice squad, call-ups like that might give us some indication what some teams are going to do you know players are going to rest or sit or whatever um but really i mean you can probably with a good set of projections sit down at 12 30 you know a half hour on sunday half hour before lock and then build a good lineup not that i recommend doing that you want to understand like why you're playing guys but you know that that is when we have the most information yeah and i feel like this is actually tricky because we have eight 4 p.m games this week. And I assume there's going to be more, you know, late breaking news than usual. And we have more late games in play. Have you been thinking through how like late swaps uh, might even come into play more than they would on a normal cash week? I haven't. I mean, I'm a little behind this week with like that type of stuff, just because of New Year's Eve and holidays and everything. Um, But like, this is the kind of week where unexpected stuff could happen that we have to react to on Sundays. Like we've seen in years past, you know, teams where we don't necessarily know their motivation, whether they're going to sit guys or rest guys like this year, it seems like maybe the bills or the the Steelers or maybe the bucks. We don't necessarily know how much effort they're going to put in, which starters are going to play or how much, like if, if we come out on Sunday and Sunday inactives come out and, and Stefan Diggs and, and John Brown and Cole Beasley are all inactive. Like maybe, you know, it's Isaiah McKenzie week or like, you know, a 3K or something like that. Like, you just don't know. So it is definitely a week, you know, every week is like this. But this week in particular, you really want to stay flexible. Right. And yeah, my inclination, uh, again, we'll we'll dive into some more specifics. But if you, you know, say you're, you're jamming in your studs or your, your lock plays this week, you know, that it's fine when they are. But I'd almost prefer to have my fringier punt plays later in case even more optimal plays open up because of news. So I don't have to eat the fringe plays early. Yeah. I mean, I think that is certainly a fine approach to do it. As long as you're not sacrificing too much value, like having that flexibility, having that late swap potential is definitely very nice. But I think sometimes people can become a little too focused on that and, and they'll sacrifice like actually playing a better play just to have that, you know, that optionality. And so it's something you kind of need to a little subjectively kind of weigh and, and, and judge, you know, how you want to do it. So just in general, from a cash game perspective, when you put those first couple of pieces in your shell, where are you starting? Because the GPP bros, they're generally starting with a leverage point or a stack that they like. And then going from there, um, you know, building in correlation, these are things that aren't of concern to us cash game players so where do you like to start when you go to finally make that lineup i like to start with the best plays pete i I love it the best plays um and i mean it like it's kind of a bit and like it's kind of glib to say but like really that is what cash games are about it's about playing the best plays and it's easier said than done obviously but you know when it comes down to it 
ownership, leverage, correlation, even stuff like floor and safety that people talk about, like all of that is, is either irrelevant or secondary to playing the best plays. You know, if the best play on the slate is going to be 2% owned, you should still play them in cash games. It's rare that that happens, but you should be playing the best plays if you want to maximize, absolutely maximize your long-term EV. That's literally all that matters. Now, go ahead. Gonna I was just going to ask when you were meant you referenced ownership, do you ever um, even like break ties in, in favor of ownership? If two guys are the exact same projected point, but you think one's going to be 20% less owned, even in cash, are you breaking ties in that, in that direction? Right. And so that's where kind of the subjectivity of it, like the personal risk tolerance comes in. Um, I mean, with, with projections, there's really no ties. There's always somebody projected higher, but if it's, you know, a 10th of a point higher for, you know, the lower owned guy, you can definitely just play the higher owned guy. And you probably shouldn't cash games from a game theory perspective, you know, to a certain extent, you do want to mitigate risk a little bit. You do want floor a little bit. Um, because especially in football, it's not like we have a billion slates to play out and let the, you know, let the, the EV really find you. You know, you have a limited number of slates. There is more variance than we would actually like in football. And so playing it a little bit safer is definitely something that, you know, people do, sharper people do. So I was going to ask you about that, too, because I've heard cash game guys talk before about even like chalk that they're not necessarily in love with just eating it, knowing that so much of the field is going to have it. And if that chalk goes off and you don't have it, you're just buried in that week. So is that like an actual consideration to seek out dupes in, in your cash game lineups to lower your variance? Yeah, it kind of is. It's something I always really struggle with and hate like an MLB. I won't do it. MLB. I will just play the best plays. I don't care who's chalk because we have 180 playable days and over the long run, it's going to even out and I don't have to worry about what, you know, suboptimal play donkeys are, are, are shoving into their lineups in football. In football, again, we don't have as many slates. And so, you know, a couple bad slates where a guy like that goes off can, can really hurt your year. And so again, it's personal preference. It's uh, you know, assuming the guy is not an actual optimal play playing him is going to cost you a little bit of money in the long run but it's going to increase your, your floor. It's going to decrease your variance type of thing. And so, uh, you know, if he's like close to an optimal play, if he's just like a good play, but not a great play, I'll probably play him. Um, but if it's, you know, a bad play that people just are just on because of group think or recency bias or whatever, I'll just say, screw it. And, and I'm not going to play that guy. And you, now I know you are a big believer in sample sizes. You just mentioned, you know, in the long run, I know the same stuff you talk about with BVP and individual matchup stuff, how noisy that is. Now, specifically as it pertains to my cash game play, I envision a a very long career playing cash games. I mean, theoretically thousands and thousands of slates, but hypothetically, if I were to just have like a one week sample of playing cash games and that would fall. I ever happen to play, should I be approaching it a little differently, knowing I'm not going to have a large sample size to smooth out that play the best play variance? Again, it depends what you want to do. If you want to maximize your EV, maximize your absolute probability that you are going to make the most money this week, let's call it week 17, Mm -hmm. you should still just play the best plays. But if you want to decrease your var- or yeah, decrease your variance a little bit, you want to play a little bit safer, then yeah, then you can eat some chalk. Um, okay. uh, that that's what I needed to hear. We're gonna, we're gonna play the best plays. Let's let's start on the top end here. Not necessarily the best plays when you include everything price and that, but just the pure raw point best plays. I saw you updated the blitz. Um, I even saw you just tweet out like a half hour ago that you are ready to hammer the over on Derrick Henry rushing props. I thought we were going to come on here and bash Derrick Henry. He doesn't catch passes. He flopped in the snow game against the Packers. Have you turned on me? I feel like the blitz has turned on me, honestly. (laughs) I I hate Derrick Henry. It's no secret that I I hate Derrick Henry. I think D. Hember is the dumbest thing, especially name-wise. It's terrible. Um, He doesn't catch passes. He normally doesn't project well. It feels like every time he's – He's even like a marginally good play. He just flops. Uh, And then the blitz comes out and he's like, you know what? Derrick Henry, 140 yards, a touchdown and a half, and and the top raw point play on the slate. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'm playing Derrick Henry. 
Yeah, I mean, what do you, you have him projected right now for almost 140 rushing yards. I mean, that's massive. I mean, it's insanity. This this is the same projection the Blitz had for him, I think, two weeks ago against Detroit. It had him projected for about 140 yards um, and, you know, more than a full touchdown and about 27 points. And he was fine that week. I think he finished with, like, 28. But he also got, like, vultured, like, three times. I think Tannehill snuck two in. Darrington Evans caught – caught a pass in garbage time. Like they just stopped using him in the red zone in the fourth quarter. Um, So like, this is a, like, it's basically the same spot and it's a good spot. Like Tennessee has a high total. They're a big favorite without being a massive favorite. Because the thing with Henry is that like, he gets, you know, when, when the game is close or not a blowout, he gets literally all the carries. Like since the middle of the season, he's gotten 91% of the carries in non blowouts. Um, but then when they blow, when they're blowing the other team out, you know, then they'll work in Evans or Foreman or McNichols or whoever. Um, but they're only a touchdown favorite here. So like, it should stay fairly close. I think the touchdown equity is high. Like the mat, the matchup, I hate, I hate run defense and matchups for running backs, but like, it's good. Um, and, and so when the blitz kind of runs all the math, like, so are you telling me if you were to go build a lineup now and you say, you know, we start with the best plays, we start with the top plays. Right now, we're clicking Derrick Henry over Devontae Adams as our number one play in that lineup. I mean, I think first guy in for me is probably a cheaper guy or two. But when we're talking about the high end, I do think it's probably Henry. But honestly, I want to I want to get both of them this week. And I think it's very possible yeah. to get both. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. I, I do really want Devontae Adams. Let's talk about this kind of second tier here. Um, I ran the optimals uh, on the Blitz a, a little bit ago, and we'll tab over to those in a second. But Alvin Kamara is not showing up in any of those. Uh, very expensive, but another guy I think cash game players would ideally like to find a way up to. Pretty hard to play all three of those 9K guys. Maybe impossible, but what's your take on Kamara this week? I mean, I love Kamara in general, and I feel like my brand is usually to say Henry's a bad play and play Kamara because he catches passes. That's, I mean, that's clearly not what the Blitz is saying this week. Like, Henry projects for, what, two and a half or three points more than Kamara? Um, like, Kamara's going to catch passes. Michael Thomas is still out. He's going to get a quarter of the targets. You know, I think people are maybe a little too excited about him because he scored what six touchdowns last week or whatever, but that's obviously not something we can bank on or expect to continue. Like Henry's touchdown equity is going to be higher here, and Kamara splits carries with uh, with Latavius Murray, you know, and, and they're they're a pretty solid favorite here, I think. So it could be a little more Murray than usual. You know, it's just the uh, it's just I mean, like I said, I'm a math guy. I trust the projections. I hate Henry. The blitz is normally not like in love with Henry. This is probably like the second highest projection Henry has ever had. And so like the blitz knows these things. I I built the system with everything that matters and it knows that Henry doesn't catch passes. It knows, you know, all this stuff. And so if it still likes Henry more than, then I'm going to trust it and I'm going to play Henry. Yeah. I think, uh, have you thought at all about, is this, uh, it feels like a three running back week in cash with all the value opening up with some of the pump play running backs. Is that where you're at? That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely one cheaper guy that I think is a lock, and I think there's a couple others that are you know very easy to slot in. Yeah, and let's um just finish up here on the top end. I would say the other two plays up here that I'm really interested in would be Justin Jefferson and Jonathan Taylor. Do you have any other favorite guys of this like um, secondary top end range? Not really, because it's kind of tough to get there. Like, if you're trying to play one of Henry and Kamara and Devontae Adams, like, you're probably not playing a 7, you know, 7K guy or an 8K guy also. Like, you know, Jefferson, I think you can make a case for, um, you know, especially if you want to do the narrative. I guess he's like, you know, if he has like an explosion game, he could get like the rookie record and and Cook is out. So maybe they're going to throw more. Like, I think you make a case for Jefferson. He projects well enough um, for the price. But he is tough to get alongside Henry, uh, and especially if you're trying to do Adams, like you just can't do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't, you know, become a a cash game bro to not get to be able to um, indulge in a few narratives, Derek. I mean, I feel like this is part of the experience. Uh, My buddy Anthony Amik says, see if I can pull this up. Yesterday he had a thread going of some of the bigger milestone uh, narratives that were 
going this week. Uh, let's see here. I'll pull it up. But yeah, you mentioned the Jefferson one, 47 receiving yards uh, away uh, for Vikings rookie record and 111 from the league record there. And he's, uh, you know, the math lines up too, right? I mean, he's just projecting as a great raw point value too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, I have no problem going Jefferson. I think you probably have to sacrifice Adams to do it. And I don't love doing that. But Jefferson is is a good play, and he's in a great matchup. Like he's in a dome against the Lions. Like it's basically the best possible matchup, especially if we think they're going to be throwing more. So another big uh, speaking of narratives, um, it's it's all about motivation this week. Which teams have something to play for? Which ones don't? Um, how much are you factoring in uh, team motivation to your projections, and then uh, maybe into hand your how how your hand selecting your cash game lineup. Is this factoring into your process this week? It's factoring into the extent that it matters. You know, like some teams are are completely unmotivated. And so their guys aren't going to play. Like we know Patrick Mahomes is not going to play this week. That gets factored into projections because it has to, like you have to project Mahomes sitting and Henny or whoever's the quarterback, you know, playing for them. Um, But like, you know, saying this team is out of contention. So their players, they're just not going to try as hard. I don't buy that. Like these are NFL players. They have monetary incentives beyond just the competitive playoff stuff. Um, I, I think that's complete noise and, and, and nonsense. Okay. Let's, um, let's flip this and uh, sort by points per dollar here. See some of these uh, cheaper plays that are popping here. Uh, when I ran optimals, you're seeing a lot of Marvin Jones. He's a little scary uh, to play in cash in my opinion, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing Malcolm Brown is the guy that you think is a lockdown here on the cheaper end. Yeah, I think Brown and Reynolds, as of right now, they're they're kind of like the two like stone locks. They're the first guys in for me. They they open stuff up. Like the Rams, if we're playing the motivation game, the Rams still have something to play for. You know, Jared Goff is out, but that's not because he's like sitting, you know, for rest or whatever. Like he's he's hurt, and Cooper Cup is out, but he's got COVID. So like they still want to play. Um, Malcolm Brown should be the lead back here. You know, presumably Cam Akers is going to be out again this week, and if that's the case, like Brown's going to get you know, almost all the groundwork. Like we know he's, you know, a decent pass catcher because he was the lead pass catching back for them for most of the year. Um, And he's basically free. Is that what's kind of separating Malcolm Brown from Ty Johnson and Rodney Smith as the other kind of starting pump play? I'm, I'm tabbing over to your receiving projection for him. I guess it's pretty similar. Why, why do you think he's separating so much from those guys? I think part of it is going to be game environment. Like Arizona is the fastest paced team in football. So like just the raw plays for the Rams are going to be higher than they are for, for the jets against a slow paced New England team, you know, for, uh, for Rodney Smith against a slow paced saints team. Um, and I think also we can be a little more, I don't know, I guess certain that this is Brown's backfield. Like he was a guy who was getting real work this year. Whereas, you know, Rodney Smith, like he's, you know, was, the, the second of two backups to Mike Davis. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. I will say we saw Ty Johnson come in that game that Frank Gore got hurt, the game where he had 22 carries against the Raiders. Um, how many targets did he have? Two targets. And they have been willing to use him in the passing game here as well. Um, so I do think there's upside for him to have a pretty nice role. Uh, I agree with you with Rodney Smith. I could see him being in more of a timeshare, them using Curtis Samuel more. His role seems less secure than uh, these other guys. Yeah, and it's not like I dislike these guys. Like I think Ty Johnson and Rodney Smith are are good plays. You know, If you're doing three running backs this week, it probably is Henry, Malcolm Brown, and one of those two guys. Yeah, and someone did mention in the chat, and I saw this the other day, that Malcolm Brown is uh, is a little banged up right now. Um, and I think that's something we need to monitor as well. I'm just pulling up to see the latest news. Um, okay, thank you, Roto World, uh, for not having an updated blurb on him. I think RotoWire had one. But um, as I search this, do you – because right now, as we kind of talk it through, I know a lot is going to change. I think I'm probably gravitating toward – maybe playing Henry with like two of these guys. Um, What other running back would be in the conversation? It sounds like Henry and Malcolm Brown are locks for you. Who would be like your third favorite play right now? It's Ty Johnson or Rodney Smith. I don't know. I don't know which one yet. Um, I know the blitz likes Ty Johnson a little bit more. Um, It seems like across the industry, others are maybe a little higher on Rodney Smith. So it's really close. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, if I had the extra 300, I'd probably play Ty Johnson. If I need that, I'd probably play Rodney Smith. Like it's just kind of one of those toss up calls, like whichever one kind of works better. Yeah. Uh, And just to put a cherry on this with Malcolm Brown. um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. He did have the shoulder and it sounds like they've been limiting his reps in practice to get him ready for Sunday, knowing he's all they have. So I'm not too concerned about it right now, but I, I think it's definitely something to monitor here as well. Um, Let's see here. Uh, other stuff going on on the low end. I guess we are, if we are paying up for Devontae Adams, um, we are going to have to go cheaper at wide receiver here. You said you like Josh Reynolds. We got Cooper Cup not playing this week. Um, okay, I need to, I, I was like, Steven Sims is 2,400. That must be from a showdown slate popping up there. Yeah, that's got to be what that is. <laughs> All right, we got, we'll get tabbed over to the right thing yeah, here. They're, they're the night game, so he's not on the slate. That's going to be a showdown salary. Um, how do you, um, how do you start to think about um, tight ends um, for for cash games? I know uh, my arch nemesis this week, Adam Levitan, I will be doing a show with him tomorrow night. We are doing a, a very high profile uh, head-to-head. I will be picking his brain. I know this year he's been a big believer in paying down, punting it off at tight end. It has burned him a little bit, missing out on some of the Travis Kelsey uh, run this year. How do you, in general, approach approach tight ends in cash games? Yeah, I generally don't love to pay up for tight end unless it really is like an elite tight end, well priced in a good spot. I probably had less Kelsey than than I you know I wish I had in retrospect. I do think Kelsey's run good, especially with touchdowns this year. Um, but uh, I generally like to pay pay down or. It's, it's rare that I think a tight end is like a lock, like especially this week. There, there's no lock tight end. There's probably five guys that you can slot into your cash games depending on the rest of your build and be fine. And so for right now, especially, like we're still waiting on news. I have no idea who I'm playing at tight end. It's probably one of those top five or six guys point per dollar, though. I'm not considering yeah. anyone else. Yeah, Kittle's tough, right? Because he looks so good in his first game back, um, you know, projects solidly, uh, nice matchup, all that jazz. But I feel like I'm not going to want to pay up to 6000 on a tight end this week. That's how I'm feeling. And he is showing up in some optimal lineups right now. And I'm like, do I want to pay six k for Kittle? Um, I mean, Kittle is basically, I mean, I don't want to say he's basically Kelsey, but he's like Kelsey light. And we, we've been paying 8 and 9K for Kelsey the last couple weeks, like – or at least he's been like viable at those prices. And so 6K for Kittle, when there's no Debo, when there's no Ayuk, where he's going to be the lead guy, like he came back, got, you know, a good amount of snaps, looked good last week. Um, I do think Kittle is in play if if he's kind of who fits. But again, 6K for Kittle does make it tough to get Henry and Adams and, you know, whatever else. So, so going cheaper is probably where I will end up, but I do like Kittle. Yeah. And uh, one thing I'm noticing, just thinking about, you mentioned Malcolm Brown, Josh Reynolds. Um, I'm just sitting here seeing, you know, Irv Smith looks like one of the better tight end plays. We talked about him and Justin Jefferson. How do you feel about uh, playing multiple teammates from the same team? Obviously, it's all price sensitive, but just generally, uh, does that give you more pause um, or, or is that something you're completely OK to do? Uh, it depends on the situation. You know, if they're just like overwhelmingly the best plays, then then I'll, I'll play six guys from the same team. You know, that, that's never the case. But like I will do it if, if they're all, you know, if all of a sudden, you know, Jefferson, Thielen, Irv Smith, Madison, and throw in whoever else. Um, if they're all priced at like $300 on DraftKings, like of course you're going to play all of them. Like, and so there's a, there's a price point for everyone. Um You know, I don't think Irv or Jefferson are overwhelmingly the best plays this week, but if you wind up on both of them in your cash lineup, like that's just kind of how it comes together. I'm fine with that. Like they're both good plays in a vacuum. They're both good values. There's reasons to like both of them. And so, so that's fine. Like uh, three or four weeks ago when, you know, we had the Drew Brees was back for the first time and Michael Thomas was out, um, you know, Alvin Kamara. Emmanuel Sanders, Traquan Smith were all like severely underpriced. Even Jared Cook was severely underpriced. So playing three of those guys in cash was totally fine. You know, if that's the way it happens, then then that's fine. Yeah. Let's uh, move over and talk about quarterback. We haven't talked about that um, much at all. I'm curious your thoughts, just my kind of uh, glances at the quarterback position this week. No one is like really jumping out to me. Is just like the automatic jam. Am I missing something or are you feeling that as well? No, I'm definitely feeling that. There's no quarterback that I feel 
that I feel great about. There's a few I'm considering, but again, it's kind of just going to come down to which guys fit. Um, you know, there, there's nobody great this week. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's uh it's tough in the uh you know the you know the top end plays are expensive but have some some question marks and especially if we're paying up for these other guys um who of the kind of like punt play quarterbacks do you think is the most intriguing to you obviously lock popping the most um you know we've heard some John Wolford talk here although he's not popping too much here any of these gross guys you're kiss- considering I mean, I'm sort of considering Locke. I don't think I'm going to end up there. But again, if you're trying to jam in some of these expensive guys, like he projects as the top point per dollar quarterback on on the slate. Um, you know, I've looked at other systems too. Like it's not just the blitz. Like at 5K, Locke is projecting well here. He's in a good matchup. Uh, and he's, he's 5K. So, so I do like Locke. I don't think I want to end up there. Uh, Matthew Stafford, like if he's healthy, I think he's definitely underpriced here. Five, six in a dome passing game script against the Vikings defense. You know, they're playing at a, a much faster pace since Patricia got fired. You know, Bevel kind of said he wanted to play at a fast pace. That's what they've been doing. So I like Stafford at five, six. If Stafford is out, I think Chase Daniels like four, nine or something. So if we're confident he plays the whole game, I'd have, I'd have no problem punting with him. I'd probably feel more confident in him than Locke. Yeah. Um, or I think you can spend up. Like I think, I mean, Deshaun Watson, you kind of showed earlier, like he projects far and away above the other guys. He's just expensive. Yeah. And I see some um, Jeffrey over in the Roto Grinders chat. Lamar needs less than a hundred yards rushing to be first back to back 1000 yard rusher. These are the narratives we love. I have seen some people on Twitter telling me I need to play Lamar in my cash game lineup. It doesn't appear like he's in the conversation at this price point for cash. What do you think he is? I mean, based on the projections, no, like Watson is so much better, but like if you weren't playing Watson and you were, you know, playing a high price guy, like I think Lamar is fine. The matchup's fine. You know, maybe, you know, maybe the blitz isn't accounting for that narrative. If we think he's going to run a little bit more, I don't love narratives in general, but like, that's the kind of thing where he can just actively decide, okay, I want to run more. I'm just going to scramble on a couple of these plays. Um, But like Watson, the blitz has been high on Watson all year and and it's worked out for the most part. I think like they have been aside from the chiefs and the bills, they've been the most pass heavy team in a neutral context in all of football this year. And they're, they're always playing from behind. Like this week, they're going to be playing from behind against Tennessee, you know, at home in the dome. And uh, you know, Watson can score points with his legs. Like he's just, He's just always really solidly good. And so I have no problem paying up there if that's the way it happens. One kind of bigger picture question I had for you is obviously in head to head specifically, like getting access to a ceiling is still important. Like you can get rewarded more so across head to heads than double ups when you access a ceiling with these guys. How do you kind of think about that as it pertains to constructing your cash game lineup where you do want access to that ceiling where you could win 95% of your head to heads on the week versus just looking at getting in the most projected points in your lineup. So I think they kind of go hand in hand. And I think it kind of comes down to a little bit uh, cash game game selection. Like if you're playing more head to heads than you are double ups and 50 fifties, you are potentially building your lineup a little bit differently. Like the people who say, you know, you gotta, you gotta block the chalk or you gotta, you know, have a high floor. You only have to beat 50% of the people. You know, you don't get anything extra if you beat 90%. That That's not true if you're playing mostly head-to-heads. And I prefer playing head-to-heads, you know. First, because it lets you just play the better plays. Um, the better plays generally have higher projected points, higher ceilings. Um, it lets you spread out your variance more because it's not just like all or nothing. If you're under 50%, you lose it all, if, you know. So it lets you spread out your variance more. Um, the rake is a little bit lower on head to heads than a lot of the double ups um, and, and 50 fifties. And so, so yeah, I mean, I prefer playing like that. I prefer just playing the best plays, playing the plays that have the upside, like a guy like Watson, he, he certainly has that upside this week. And so, you know, if you're playing, if you're playing head to head, so a guy like that, you know, can make sense. Yeah. And do you, do you ever consider um, correlation in that regard? Like if, if we're jamming Henry and then we're playing Watson, obviously that correlation can make intuitive sense there. Um, but is that anything you ever consider for your, for cash, like the GPP bros do? It's rare because correlation really doesn't matter 
in cash. Um, if anything, like it, I mean, it, it increases your variance, obviously. That's what, that's why GPP bros account for it because if the game script is flipped, let's say the, the Texans get out to a lead in this game and, you know, Watson's not throwing and Henry's not running and you have both of them like you're, you're dead probably. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down to it at the end of the day in head to heads, we're playing the best plays. We're not playing for these, you know, minority outcomes. We're playing for the most likely outcomes. And the most likely outcome is the Titans are playing with a lead. Henry's running most of the game. Watson's throwing most of the game and they're both going to get there together and smash. Circling back to that idea of, you know, head to head being different than double ups. Do you ever run two lineups, one for head to head games and one for double ups? Or are you generally a one lineup guy? Um, I play very, very few double ups. I play almost, almost all head to heads, um, probably like 90% head to heads, 10% double ups for me. Um, I'll split lineups sometimes, um, you know, just to spread out the variance. Like I think these two, three K, these two, three K receivers, you know, one of them projects for a half target more, but it's only a half target. So I'll just split them. <laughs> there we <laughs> and, go, uh, baby. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so I'll do that sometimes it's, it's again, it's a, it's a risk tolerance kind of thing. You know, you're lowering your EV slightly by playing a lesser play. Um, but you're, you know, increasing your floor, reducing your variance. For sure. Yeah. Let's uh, touch on the bottom tier or, or the better kind of pump play wide receivers. And then we can build out a cash shell for week 17. Appreciate Derek Cardi coming on here. Uh, I use his blitz projection system all year as a GPP bro. I will be using it in week 17 as a cash game beta. And uh, it feels great. It feels great to be using the blitz and talking shop with Derek Cardi. You mentioned Josh Reynolds. Uh, any of these other guys popping, I want you to say nice things about my guy, LaVisca Chenault. I mean, I have a signed mini helmet of the guy within a foot of me. Tell me, can LaVisca be in my cash shell? Yeah, he can. So, so, I mean, obviously you see, he already projects pretty well. And today is the day we get a lot of injury news. So I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting the, the news on DJ shark. Cause if shark is out, then even just a little bit of a bump to LaVisca basically would make him a cash game lock. So I think you can definitely build under that assumption right now. And even if Shark does play, I still think LaVisca is viable. Yeah. Yeah, I I am now as a cash game guy, I am uh, nixing Jets out of my wide receiver player pool. I have played Denzel Mims every week. I don't think I can do it as a cash game player. No, I don't think I can either. Um, I wish I didn't do it last week with Crowder um, because that actually worked out really well if you played him. Yeah. Um, But Mims... I mean, there's been a lot of weeks this year where Mims is like, you know, the top point per dollar guy or like a top three point per dollar guy outside the top five. There's, there's just no way I'm, I'm not, I'm not about that anymore. (laughs) Oh yeah. Me either, dude. Did I, I don't know if you heard, but I'm, I'm done with air yards, man. I'm done with them. I heard. I mean, (laughs) um, what about, uh, Robbie? He is an interesting guy here. He's going to be kind of more in that, um, dead range as far as, you know, the, the studs and duds builds. Uh, but he's just a guy who has locked in volume every week. I mean, what would you say? He's probably underpriced by five or 600 here at least. Yeah, I would say so. So Robbie's definitely a guy that I'm considering. Robbie's a guy that I think fits certain builds very well. You know, he's not overly expensive. Like you're not sacrificing Devontae or Henry necessarily to get him. So, uh, so yeah, I, I like Robbie. I think he's a guy that, that we can consider. Like he just, I mean, he's a guy who, his raw, if you look at like his game logs or his raw fantasy points, like they're not as high as they should be because he's had really bad touchdown variants this year. And that just happens sometimes. We but haven't talked at all. Share, yeah, go What's ahead. that? No, like the target share is just, just massive. And, and you have to expect, you know, that variance to correct itself eventually. Right. We haven't talked about the Chiefs much as much at all. Obviously, Chad Henney's going. Uh, uh, my guy, Davis Maddock, uh, I will be going on the Gill cast on Sunday night to tilt my cash game team. He really wants to play Miko Hardman here. He's at 4,200. What are your thoughts on on Miko and kind of the Chiefs passing game in general here with Chad Henney? I think Hardman is viable. I think Hardman is also a guy that people want so hard <laughs> to happen and, and he's just, he's never happened. And, uh, you know, like, I think people kind of project what they want to see and not necessarily what the most likely outcome for him is. I think he's a fine play this week. Like, especially if we get word that for sure, Kelsey, Tyreek, Watkins, they're all out. Then I think maybe we can think about playing him. 
but it's not like he's cheap. He's not Josh Reynolds cheap. Like he's he's forty two hundred, and he's playing with Chad Henney with like a twenty team total. So, it, you know. It, and how do you think about, um, you know, I said I was done with uh, with air yards, but kind of how like average depth of target factors into how these guys get their points. Obviously, Danny Amendola is going to rack up his projection way more with shorter passes versus, you know, Denzel Mims on the other extreme, who's super deep down the field. One of the reasons I like LaVisca is I feel like he's a nice blend of that. Some deep shots along with manufactured touches. Um, Mikko Hardman, I feel like he's kind of has a connotation more of a, a boom bust guy. So are you thinking about the ways these guys kind of the floor uh, and how they get used impacts their, their projection in cash games? I don't care a whole lot about that. Cause like it does get baked into the projection, you know, a guy like Danny Amendola, that's, you know, really good. I mean, he's much better on DraftKings and on FanDuel or in non PPR formats because he's going to, you know, catch a high percentage of balls. Those reception points are going to add up. And that's maybe not a thing for Hardman. Like, even if he gets the same number of targets, say, as as Amendola, he's probably going to catch fewer of them. He's going to have, you know, a better chance of, you know, catching a 50-yarder or catching a long touchdown or something. But there is that that wider range of outcomes. Um, so you can consider that for sure, especially in cash games. Like, the floor is is the more important part, you know, when push comes to shove. But really, it's the mean outcome that, that I care about the most. And so right now, Hardman's not quite there. Like if you run probably 10 or 20 optimal lineups, he'll show up in one or two of them. Um, but it's not like he's a guy I'm jamming in right now. Yeah, let's uh, let's scroll through some optimals here and see uh, anything that's standing out to us right now. And then we'll wrap up building a cash shell here on Friday afternoon. If you guys are watching and not subscribed to the channels, please do so. If you're over at Roto Grinders, hit the subscribe button. If you're on my channel, hit the subscribe button. Follow Derek Carty on Twitter and also send him a head-to-head. He said he hasn't been feeling the love in the head-to-head invite. It is, of course, Derek Carty on uh, DraftKings. There it is. Please scoop us, bro. Derek Cardi on DraftKings. So, oh, I, I, actually, I'm curious. Did you post games this week? Because maybe that's why I don't get head to head. I post games, so if people want my games. Like they can just go to the lobby and find me. Okay, yeah, that's that's fair. Um, no, I haven't felt the need to post because I I maxed it out with uh invites, and I was uh I was happy to just take games of people who wanted them, uh, as opposed to uh to randos who I was just a random uh, name. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> um, okay, so over here in the optimals, um, ran this a uh, hundred of these using the blitz projections. I mean, we can see the exposures here: Malcolm Brown really popping, Henry Adams, of course, Reynolds. So very similar to kind of what we were talking about, just by feel. Uh, Marvin Jones, one of those weird ones here. I feel like I would try to find the five hundred to get up to Robbie if I could, and not play Marvin. But what do you do? with a guy like this who pops in optimals that you don't necessarily feel that great about? When he's popping that hard, I think you just play him. Like you ran a hundred lineups. He's in literally only one lineup. He's not in. So like he's a good play. And sometimes good plays are good plays. Even if they're not like, you know, the plays that feel good or the plays that touts are going to talk about. Sometimes the math just tells you this guy's gross, but he's a good play and you should play him anyway. And I'm fine with Marvin, you know, like that. Like he's, he's you know, been a number one receiver in terms of volume since Galladay went out. He's getting 23% of the targets. He's at home. He's in a dome. Stafford's probably back. He's against this below average Vikings defense. Good passing game script, high pace. Um, so I see no reason not to play Marvin right now. Now let's say we get that, uh, what's it What's it called? That, uh, that DJ Shark news. You yeah. Know? Then, then maybe LaVisca becomes more of a priority or something like that. But as of right now, I'd have no problem playing Marvin Jones if, if this was the slate starting in 10 minutes. Gotcha. Yeah, and it's interesting too because you go through the optimals right now and it's it's almost – um it's preferring like a mid-range running back along with Malcolm Brown and Henry. Like you're getting Jacobs there. You're getting Swift there. You're getting Chris Carson there. That's interesting to me. Uh, how, how do you think about that when we kind of were saying, you know, we might be willing to play two of the punt running backs with Henry? Yeah. So, I mean, the thing with optimal lineups is they're just trying to, I mean, they're taking the projections and they're trying to, to put as many points into a single lineup as possible. And so you'll wind up with, with some weird stuff sometimes, especially on weird slates like Josh Jacobs. I think right now you showed he's in the top optimal lineup. 
I wouldn't bet he's in more than like 10 or 15% of, of the lineups. Like he's not a guy that the blitz really likes. He's a guy that just fits in that yeah. construction. Um, yeah. And it and does seem like that's the thing that the optimal is fitting in all those points at once from those other spots. And then it has about, you know, 6,300 left and right. it's, it's putting in the most there. So yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Eric uh, Belair, he has a question. He he's loving Baker Mayfield this week. We haven't talked about him. He wants to know why maybe he's not projecting as well. I mean, I imagine this is like a narrative thing where people are like, well, the Browns have to, you know, the Browns have to win to get into the playoffs. And, and Baker was, was really good last week without any wide receivers or whatever. Um, you know, I gotta, I gotta play some Baker, but the thing with Baker is that like one, he's not like an especially good quarterback. He's getting his guys back. Um, but like, this is a run heavy team. This is, this is a team that is the most run heavy offense in all of football. And they're what a ten or eleven point favorite, so they're going to be able to run as much as they want. So like the volume for Baker is probably not going to be there. It's not like the team total is that high. It's kind of middle of the road, and so it's just not a game that sets up well for Baker. So there you go, Eric. It sounds like if you want to play Baker, you need to turn your back on cash games and become a GPP bro again, where both <laughs> Derek and I will give you the uh, the green light to play Baker. Um, Okay, so yeah, I'm just scrolling through here, seeing if we see anything else interesting. I mean, at the quarterback, getting a lot of Stafford. We've mentioned Watson. We mentioned Locke as the other pump plan. I did hear someone in the chat mention Cousins earlier. He looked like one of the cheaper guys that was projecting well. Um, it might be kind of a way to not have to go up to Watson, but not have to go super gross with Locke. What do you think about Stafford and Cousins here with as much as they're showing up? I guess Cousins not as much, but. Yeah, I mean, Cousins... Yeah, ha- Cousins has a wider range of, of outcomes because, like, we don't know without Cook how much are they going to pass. When when they were without Cook in week six or seven or whenever it was, they passed a lot. That was one of their past heaviest weeks of the year, but it's also only one game. You know, when they were without Cook, I think a couple games at the end of last year, that didn't really happen. So if they wind up just passing a ton, which this is a spot where they certainly could, you know, against a bad Detroit pass defense – um, then, then Cousins becomes really appealing. But for me, I'd probably rather take Stafford, who is on the other side of that game. So the pace is going to be the same, basically, you know, they're in the same game. And he's the one with a better game script. Like the Vikings have, have a higher total, but they're a very run-heavy team to begin with, with the opportunity to run as much as they want this game. Now, they don't have their main running back, but this is still a spot where we'd expect them to lean more run-heavy and, and the Lions to be, you know, more pass heavy. So, so I like Stafford probably more, especially cheaper. Yeah. Um, let's touch on this question and then we'll build our lineup uh, because we can tab over to defense here. Um, the Browns showing up in so many lineups. I mean, makes sense. 2,500 going against Mason Rudolph, but Frederick asked, do you ever play a defense against players in your lineup? Obviously this is more of a no, no for GPP bros. I'm assuming it's, it's fine if the projections work out that way for cash. Yeah, in cash games, it, it's totally fine. Like, it really doesn't even matter. Um, I mean, defense in general really doesn't matter. Like, it's so, so variant. You know, play play the defense that fits, especially if it's cheap. Um, and a lot of time, I mean, there's been plenty of time, probably five or six times this year, I've played a defense against, you know, against my running back or against my wide receiver. Um, because it, it's really not even that negatively correlated, you know, especially in, in a mean sense. Like, you know, if, uh, if the defense, you know, catches an interception or whatever, like, you know, or sacks the quarterback, like they're, especially if it sacks, like they're still staying on the field. They're still going to run a play the next play. They're still going to have a chance to throw to the wide receiver. Like it's really not impacting them that much. Yeah. Um, one other question here as we build our lineup, I know, um, how often would you say your cash game lineup is, um, really, really similar to say one of the top five or top 10 optimals on the blitz. I'm just wondering how much kind of finesse I know better uh, Derek Cardi is, is <laughs> doing in his own lineup versus what the optimals are actually split, spitting out. Yeah. So, so I ran a, a study last year. I, I ran the, the top 150 optimal lineups for, for the whole season. And I studied how well each of them did. And, and the top optimal lineup was, you know, like 73% or something insane, insanely good and unsustainable last year. But when you looked at the top 150, like they were all good. They were all profitable. There was not a whole lot of drop off, you know, especially once you're inside the top five or 10 or even 50, like they're all more or less the same in the long run. 
And so, you know, you don't have to play. There's a lot of people who get really get locked on. I got to play the top optimal lineup. And sometimes that's what I'll play. Uh, but you don't have to. You know, if you think optimal number two or number six or number 13 looks better, like they're all going to be good lineups. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's build our cash game lineup here. We got about 10 more minutes. If you're watching on Roto Grinders, I believe they have the show with the PFF bros right on after us. If you guys want to keep absorbing DFS content today on New Year's Day, but Derek and I are going to build a lineup here as usual. The honors go to the guest, your favorite play right now for this cash shell. And again, lot's going to change in the next 48 hours before lock. But this is how we would build a lineup if lock was happening in eight minutes. So I mean, it's I don't know if you've heard Pete, but it's it's Dehember. So so I mean, I feel like we got to lock in Derek Henry. God, that feels so gross to do. I really don't like doing that at all. I could uh, I could hear the disdain coming from your voice when you said the words D. Hember. Oh, it's so terrible. Um, I am going to match you stud for stud. It seems like we are both on the same page with wanting to play both Devontae Adams and Derrick Henry. So let's start this lineup out in this economy with some expensive guys. We now have 4485 for the rest of this lineup per player. All right, so we're going to need some cheap guys. So, so Malcolm Brown, I think, is is pretty clearly, you know, probably the best value play on the whole slate. So, so I'm locking in Malcolm Brown. Yep. Let's get Malcolm Brown in here. Obviously, as we mentioned before, we need to keep tabs on his designation, but it sounds like he is trending in the right direction. I want to get in my guy Lavisca. Um, you know, I do think Chark isn't trending in the right direction. Derek had mentioned he's already projecting well, even with. Uh, Chark in and would project even better uh, with Chark out with an extra, you know, half target or so as we like to get in these cash games. So I'm going to go ahead and put a uh, Chanel in my, in my shell right now. It is back over to you. Um, well, let's, let's do, uh, hmm. let's do Josh Reynolds. Um, okay. I don't know if he's going to be as much of a necessity if Chanel's there, but I think we can certainly build a good lineup with both. Yeah. Um, I like that. I'm going to go ahead uh, and get defense out of the way. It seems like the Browns are the best play uh, right now at 2,500 at home versus Mason. Ray, uh, Rudolph gets us up to 5,700 per player running back tight end in QB. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is getting interesting. Yeah, so I think it's actually the more I'm looking at it now, like, and I'm kind of running, running some optimals and looking at different options. If we do get Chenault and we have, you know, Adams, Reynolds, Chenault, it could wind up being a four wide receiver week. Um, like, I mean, we could do like a Ty Johnson or a Rodney Smith here, but we could just as easily do Marvin Jones or, or Robbie Anderson or somebody like that. Um, that you would upgrade Reynolds, you think, in that scenario? Um, I, I wouldn't oh, necessarily upgrade Reynolds, but if we put like another really good receiver. wide receiver in the pool. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Um, so let's do Marvin. Let's just see how that builds. Okay. So we'll go, we'll slide Henry back up here, get Jones down in the flex. Uh, I haven't paid attention to the times. Um, but this could get us close to getting up. Who would be, is is Watson your preferred? If money is not an issue for quarterback, is Watson your guy? I think it is. I mean, I guess you can make a case for, for Lamar, but the Blitz really likes Watson more. So I, I think Watson's probably the guy. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if it gets us up to anything interesting at tight end. Let's just put in Watson and know if there's anyone at 40, uh, 100 like. still like. Um, I would say by the Blitz, it's probably Irv that fits here. Probably Irv or Fan or is what's Ingram cost? Is he actually? Oh, he's a little cheaper. Yeah. Um, he's, so like you could go Ingram and then you could get up to to Lamar if you want, yeah. or get up to Robbie from Marvin or I mean something like that. I know this is so. This looks like what's going to be the decision point. The do you go the three running backs or do you go the three running backs or the three wide? Sorry, two running backs and then you get up to whatever tight end basically, and whatever quarterback you want? Or do you go four wide receivers and get up to maybe a Justin Jefferson type and go premium there? It seems like that's where the decisions are going to come down to. Yeah, that, that's going to be the decision, I think. Because I think the first guys we put in, they're going to be kind of like, you know, the core. They're going to be the lock guys. Brown, 
you know, Henry or Kamara, if you want to do that, Adams, Reynolds, LaVisca. And then it's kind of just like what fits around that. And I think there's definitely a bunch of viable ways to go. Uh, so we're a hundred, hundred off of Robbie, but if you go down from Jackson to Watson, that works. That's right. Yeah. So we will put this in right now for our cash shell. We got up to our guy, Robbie. You know, I love hearing that it could be a four wide receiver week. And right, I guess we can get up to Irv too, if you want from, from anger. There you go. Yeah. So we have options here. I mean, I think this is what's nice. You know, like it's hard for people to go cold Turkey, you know? So for me to be able to go four wide receivers in cash, it just kind of really eases me into this new game format. Derek. Yeah. Well, I figured I want to make it a little easier for you. And I think four wide receivers is honestly a really underrated strategy in cash games. Like for so long, every cash game talent in the world was like, you have to play three running backs in cash. You have to play three running backs in cash. They're safer. They have a higher floor. And that's really not true. Like I put out a thread about it mid year about how that's really not true. They're not really that much safer. And we've seen this year, like, I know you're not a cash game, bro. So maybe you've been, oh, I am now. well, you haven't been to this point. Um, but like cash game, like chalk running backs, like the running backs that are like the obvious good plays that everyone loves. Every projection system is on. They've been the ones that have been flopping like all year. Um, yeah. So like, they're not as safe as people really think they are. And especially this year where offense is up where wide receiver efficiency is up. Uh, where teams are just getting smarter and more efficient. Um, you know, playing that four wide receiver in cash games is often both the best value and the safer play. Yep. Um, all right. We are going to wrap things up here so RG can get the PFF show fired up. Really appreciate Derek Cardi hopping on the show. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Derek Cardi. Check out the Blitz projection system. Anything else to plug, Derek, of yours that I'm forgetting? No, that's pretty much it. You know, if you're into baseball, we got the bat coming up in a couple months too. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Looking forward to that. I am looking forward to a massive, massive week 17. Um, As far as my cash game week media schedule, I will be doing a show with Adam Levitan tomorrow night. I believe 9 p.m. Eastern is when we settled on that. I will be doing the Gilcast on Sunday night. We are going to do video, special video edition of the Gilcast. Um, I said, I think I said in our text thread, if I win more than 80% of my head to heads, I will shotgun a Red Bull in tribute of Nate Noling. So, uh, it's going to be a great time. We appreciate you guys coming out for cash game week. Thank you to Roto Grinders for sponsoring us. Thank you to Derek Cardi. We will see you guys tomorrow night with Adam Levitan.